Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today for True Cybercrime at McGill. Inspired by the game Two Truths and a Lie, we're going to tell you true stories of cybercrimes that impacted victims. After most stories, we'll do a quick poll where you'll get to vote on whether or not you think it happened to a McGillian. Unless a victim went public with their story and consented to have their name appear in the news, we've used pseudonyms and removed identifying details. These are real people and real stories. In some cases, there have been several victims of the same crime, and we've amalgamated what we know of their stories and added some context. True crime stories aren't ones with happy endings. Unlike in movies, it's rare that the perpetrators are caught and brought to justice or end up discovering a conscience and making amends for their crimes. In real life, cyber criminals predominantly operate in jurisdictions outside the reach of Canadian authorities and in some countries with the tacit approval of the authorities there. And as you can see from the statistics on screen, people don't be believe they're going to be victims of cybersecurity incidents until they are. We know that these sort of in, uh, crimes are underreported. In fact, for some, the Canadian Anti-Fraud Centre estimates that only 5 to 10 percent of cybercrime victims make a report to law enforcement. Next slide. So, who am I, apart from a talking head on your screen? I'm Maria, an IT security analyst, and I'm joined by some of my colleagues in information security here at McGill. Hasten, our IT security team manager, will be my co-presenter. Alex, our Director and Chief Information Security Officer, and Sylvain, one of our IT security architects, have also joined us to answer your questions about cybersecurity. Some of us are also McGill alumni, so even when our paths have led us off campus, we've always stayed connected to the global community of McGillians. If you do have a question during the presentation, please use the Q&A button at the bottom right corner of the WebEx pane. At the end of the presentation, we will have a Q&A period, and we'll all take turns answering your questions so that people watching the recording later can also hear the answers. Speaking of, the presentation will be recorded and we will email you the link in the next few days, along with links to other helpful resources that will be mentioned today. Please feel free to share them with your colleagues, your friends, and your family. Uh, next slide. Our first cyber crime is a scam that's been around long before computers were invented. It works all too well because we are programmed to believe that people are honest and truthful. We want to trust and connect with our fellow humans, and that's a good thing. But when we do, we have to be careful because under the right circumstances, anyone can become the prey of cyber criminals. Next slide. That's what happened to Susie. One day out of nowhere, she got a Facebook friend request and chose to accept it. Her new online friend, Howard, seemed to have a fun, globe-trotting life, but still took the time to talk with her for hours every day. She had started to feel invisible in real life, so his compliments and his attention felt like the perfect antidote. He really seemed to care about how she was doing, and he made her feel special. After some time, Howard confessed he had feelings for her, even though she was married. They remained in contact, as she had grown to care for him as well. And one day, he messaged her in a panic. There was an urgent issue with his business, and he desperately needed a small loan of a few hundred dollars. Could she help? By this time, Susie had been thoroughly manipulated and groomed. The man she loved was now in trouble, so of course her instinct was to promptly help. Then more requests came, each with a different story, and each time, Susie helped. When her husband asked where the money was going, she told him she was paying bills. The requests escalated from a few hundred dollars to thousands. And with them came cover stories to tell her husband, and promises that the funds were an investment in her and Howard's future, together. Despite Susie's funds being drained dry, Howard kept asking for money, switching to using medical issues as, is as excuses, and using photoshopped pictures of injuries to back up his claims. After refinancing her house, she turned to asking for loans from friends and acquaintances. One of them became suspicious, did some digging, and was able to prove to Susie that this was a scam. There's no happy ending to the story. When Susie confronted the man masquerading as Howard, he disappeared. As a sidebar, the real Howard is also a victim. His identity and pictures were stolen from his online profiles, 
and then used by the cyber criminal in multiple romance scams. Susie filed a police report, but when these scams spent months, even years, and the cyber criminals operate abroad, it's extremely difficult to receive the money that victim retrieve the money that victims lost. For the story, we're not going to vote. I'll turn things over to Hasten, who will explain why. Next slide. So thankfully, this story isn't from a media audience, um, but statistically, unfortunately, this has happened. Uh, this can happen. Uh, in fact, we have always had smaller cases of this, whether through misconnections or impersonation, etc. This catfishing technique um, is very prevalent on the internet and in even smaller cases, even in, within our institution. I think one of the cases that we want to discuss, though, is that 99.9% uh, of romance scams are never reported, whether uh, just because of the stigma that people don't want to admit those problems, but one of the things that we do want to really encourage is that McGill is a safe environment and that there are def definitely different avenues that you can report this, whether through HR, uh, campus safety, or through the uh, student services. These are definitely uh, things that we want to encourage that you reach out to here, um, not to mention um, reporting these to the Canadian Anti Fraud Center and other uh, law enforcement agencies is always, is always a good avenue. So from that perspective, there are things that you want to be able to take care of on your own, uh, making sure that information that you post online and, and limiting what you can see, because one of those things that we talk about, especially when it comes to impersonation or identity theft is it's very easy to impersonate someone, steal that information. And, and even um, as we've seen here, uh, and we've seen cases of students or staff trying to impersonate others. The next slide, next story. In movies and the news, heists that receive coverage usually are large, with high values and high stakes. Jewels, priceless rare books, paintings, and sculptures are common features. Though these days, we also do see stories about cryptocurrency or NFT heists worth millions. A truly captivating stories often involve a whodunit. I've whiled away many an afternoon reading unsolved mysteries surrounding art heists, or even to this day, the perpetrators elude the authorities. This one, however, doesn't involve a theft that seemed glamorous, but the financial consequences were still significant. Next slide. Late one evening, when most on the East Coast were tucked into bed, cyber criminals used a compromised account to access the academic library of a prestigious institution. Over a few hours, they managed to download a massive amount of electronic resources with a plan to sell them online. At a certain point, the e-journal publishers flagged the activity as suspicious and took the precaution of blocking access for the entire institution. Did it end up causing a headache for the institution due to contractual requirements involving penalties? That will have to remain a mystery, but probably. How did they do it? Well, from a security perspective, we can tell when accounts are compromised when they start engaging in suspicious activity, but can't always tell how they were compromised to begin with. Was the password reused multiple times for other accounts? Maybe it was exposed in a data breach elsewhere and then put up for sale on the dark web. Was it a weak password that could easily be guessed or brute forced? Did the account owner fall for a phishing attack and enter their password on a malicious site? All these scenarios are plausible. The question is, did it happen at McGill? Let you vote. So unfortunately, yes, this has happened at McGill. Um, what we don't really realize is that uh, McGill does have access to quite a lot of e-journals and we invest heavily into, the, in, into that information. Uh, many other countries don't get the same type of benefits and uh, this e-journal theft has turned into a multi-billion dollar industry. Uh, we've been very lucky at McGill to be able to actually investigate our logs and we keep, a, keep an eye on things to make sure everything's working 
smoothly. And we've actually been able to identify a numerous of these compromised accounts on our own and actually share some of the tactics with our providers like OCLC. Uh, in fact, we've actually identified numerous other journal sites that have been sell, uh, selling access to uh, journals that they didn't have the right to access. That being said, we've been very lucky to work with libraries to actually increase the, uh, the use of two-factor authentication here to protect the journals. And with that, we've actually seen a significant uh, decrease in the amount of uh, attempts to even uh, steal access to our journals. So definitely one of the things that we do want to encourage is that your password is definitely a something that you would want to protect. So keeping in mind the best password practices, you are also providing uh, a, a means to secure our access to e-journal. So let's take a look at the next story. Our third story is on a topic I'm sure most of you have heard or read about, the data breach. At this point, some big company or organization seems to make the headlines every few weeks because of one of these attacks. Recently, for instance, there was Uber. Personally, I had my credit card harvested way back when Target was breached, and the original LinkedIn breach in 2012 that led to 164 million email addresses and passwords offered for sale in the dark web impacted me as well. Luckily, the credit card was when I had cancelled, and I had used a unique password for LinkedIn, which I of course changed right after I saw news of the breach. Since I can't even remember half the time where I put my glasses, much less remember multiple strong passwords, it's stored in a password manager that I secure with nice, long, memorable to me passphrase. But um, off my tangent and back to our story. In this heist, cyber criminals breached an academic institutional system, housing applicant information, and demanded thousands of dollars in ransom from prospective students in return for their personal information. Next slide, please. While ransomware threats have certainly been on the rise in the past few years, with cyber criminals not just targeting companies in the public and private sector, but also the general public, this wasn't one of those. It all started with a phishing attack. And then once they had access to confidential data, the cyber criminals tried something different. They gambled that college applicants would be willing to pay in exchange for a peek at their application files, including whether they had been accepted or rejected. Clearly, some of the cyber criminals had taken lessons in marketing, as instead of outright demanding a ransom from their victims, they spun it as a unique opportunity to purchase your entire admissions file. So the question is, could it have happened at McGill? For those who aren't sure, you should have a polling tab and you can answer yes or no if you choose. It should be next to the Q&A pane. So Thankfully, the story is not about us. Um, the targeted institutions in this case were in the United in, in the US. Um, while we definitely are talk about phishing as an in, um, one of the things that is definitely more prevalent these days is the what they've done afterwards. So ransomware is definitely in the news these days, and we've seen an, a significant uptick in uh, the use of vulnerabilities to not just gain access to a network, but also to move laterally. Um, and this, unfortunately, especially during the pan pandemic, has become uh, a very lucrative um, market uh, within the uh, and, and and within the uh, cyber uh, criminal uh, realm. So one of the things we do want to encourage is it, it, and is the uh, proper support of systems around campus, in particular, especially in the research areas where we definitely know data is more uh, widespread there, uh, to have the same security controls that we do centrally. Let's take a look at another story. Our next story comes in many flavors, and just like most of our other scams, it was around long before the internet came on the scene. Though as with many other things, the internet definitely makes things easier to do and get away with. At the root of the scam is one simple trick, impersonating someone the victim knows or trusts. I'm going to tell you two stories. 
One is going to be summarized by the next slide and one isn't. Both are all too common and often fly under the radar because the cyber criminals are careful to ask for amounts small enough that victims won't report them. They focus on quick payouts that involve minimal setup and effort on their part. With these sort of scams, they focus on maximizing their targets instead of spending a lot of time developing relationships or doing the work to infiltrate systems. They'll also vary the methods of payment. Gift cards are a popular option since they're non-refundable and generally non-traceable. Sometimes, recently, they've also been asking for popular games currency to be purchased since it again has a high resale value. Next slide, please. One morning, a research assistant, Anya, opened her email to discover that her supervisor had sent her an email asking her to buy them gift cards as a favor. When we see an email or a message come in from someone whose name we recognize, how many of us actually stop to check it's coming from an email or a phone number we know to be theirs? And even if we do recognize it, when we hit reply, do we check again? Anya, in her rush to be helpful, didn't spot the warning signs. Though I do want to add, cyber criminals are continually evolving and improving, and sometimes the signs an email or a website isn't legitimate are extremely subtle. Kevin discovered this the hard way. Busy with student life, exams, and volunteer responsibilities, when he got an email from a fellow student board member asking him to send an e-transfer to pay for some expenses with promises of reimbursement by check the next day, he didn't hesitate to promptly help. Unfortunately, it was only after he sent out the e-transfer that he discovered cyber criminals were impersonating his fellow student. They had set up an email account with a popular free email service, which they likely used in multiple other attempts. With everything online, it's incredibly easy to pretend to be someone you're not. All you have to do is look up someone in their staff directory or look at their profiles online. For example, if you're part of a student society, a volunteer organization, or work almost anywhere, for example, in a department or faculty at McGill. Go take a look at the Who We Are page. I'll bet you in most instances, there's pictures, titles, and often contact information that can easily be spoofed. So the question is, did these stories happen at McGill? So unfortunately, yes, this story is one that has affected McGill and probably not just once. Um, it's un While we expect most people would be able to pick it up, definitely one of the things that an attacker is really taking advantage of is that urgency. And especially when it comes down to pleasing your boss, if we've all been in, been in that type of situation. Um, uh, definitely another area in that is that we've grown much more accustomed to being working for mobile devices. The ease of mobile devices make, uh, uh, for our personal use and being able to take our email or text, etc., has also made it easier for an attacker to uh, to bypass some of the security controls that we have. So things like watching for incorrect but maybe smaller sender email addresses, many times those are being masked now just by the display name. Um, and this is one of the reasons why McGill is always continuing to try to find different ways to help you make the right decisions, as we will kind of touch on with new mail protections like warning if this is a, a, a new sender uh, that you haven't seen regularly or even doing a phishing link, etc. So one of the things that we do want to encourage is that you are essentially the human firewall. Um, you are the first line of defense and we, by your being suspicious or a bit paranoid at the beginning, you can actually in fact help uh, reduce these types of uh, attacks. And when in doubt, validate. So definitely one of the things we see regularly is there usually should be another way that you can validate that that request is legitimate. And um, we always uh, try to find, and especially in our marketing campaigns, making sure that we post multiple ways or communicate in multiple channels or have a back channel can always help. Let's move on to another story. Tricking someone into buying gift cards or sending an e-transfer for a few thousand works for some cyber criminals. 
but others aim for much higher payouts. The very same tactics were used to trick a university into paying $11 million to the wrong bank account. I hope this one didn't happen at McGill. What do you all think? We should have a poll for that now. Bear with us for one moment, please. There we go. Uh, next slide, please. Jason, on to you. Right, mute. Um, so, no, thankfully, this isn't us. But uh, in this case, the target institution was McEwen University and Edmonton, and it did make the news. Um, the email spoofing and these supply chain attacks are definitely a large industry as well. We're talking about uh, $3.1 billion. Uh, three, domain spoofing emails are sent per day, and there's a lot of money that comes out of these, especially when it comes down to the uh, the, the high amounts of, uh, I guess, purchasing that organizations are doing, especially institutions uh, such as ourselves. Um, we do see regular supply chain attacks or fraud, fraudulent type of payments uh, requests coming through our organization, but I guess while we think of it as a IT or cybersecurity type of uh, security incident or, uh, and protection, much of the protection isn't coming from us. In fact, a lot of these are picked up by the good processes that are built into our finance and payroll teams. And without them, these types of attacks would become a significant uh, a problem for institutions like ourselves. So, once again, I guess it's another great example of how IT security isn't the only ones helping to ensure that cyber we're not victims of cybersecurity incidents. Towards the next story. Not all cyber crimes are committed by hardened criminals, hackers, or con artists, and not all involve data theft, extortion, or any financial benefit. Sometimes it's personal, and the person committing the crime would likely be horrified to think of themselves as a criminal. Next slide, please. Spoiler alert, this story did end up in the news, so it may look familiar to some of you. A talented student had applied for a full two-year scholarship to complete a degree. The scholarship included tuition, room and board, as well as money for meals and other expenses, worth roughly $50,000 a year. If accepted, he would have studied under a renowned faculty member who only accepted two new students a year. Those that are accepted and complete the program are almost guaranteed a high-paying symphony career directly after they graduate. After an exhaustive pre-screening process, including a live audition, he patiently waited to find out if he was accepted. A month went by and finally good news. He indeed was accepted, except his girlfriend, afraid of what a long distance romance would mean for them, saw the email on his computer and deleted it before he even knew it had arrived. To make sure the school wouldn't send a follow-up email, she declined it on his behalf and then followed that email up by creating a Gmail account, impersonating the faculty member, and then emailing her boyfriend to tell him he hadn't gotten the scholarship. Instead, she made up a different offer at a different university, knowing he couldn't afford to take it. In the end, he didn't fly across the country for school and only found out months later that not only had she done it in this instance, but for yet another successful university application. How did he find out about the last one? Well, sharing goes both ways. Since they had once shared a computer, she had his passwords. And as it turned out, he knew at least one of hers. Could McGillians have been involved? Let's take a poll.
So unfortunately, yes, this is in fact the McGill story. Um, the students in question were both here at McGill, um, but it's also one of the reasons why we also talk about in our password and security awareness campaigns about treating your password like a toothbrush. Uh, even with, if you trust someone, you can't always trust that they will always be the same. I mean, we all get sick, so you wouldn't share your password with uh, with your spouse or your partner. Um, the other part of it is that, well, we can improve that trust by having two-factor authentication, which we've rolled out across the board, but this only applies to the account. So definitely when we talk about trust and sharing, it won't be just about the account. It's also about the computers and systems you share, as uh, Marie also mentioned. One of the things that we can always talk about too is that when you do get those 2FA prompts and, and whatnot, definitely we are trying to get, improve that whole context. So being aware of what is actually happening when it comes down to two-factor authentication. And if you ever suspect the account is compromised, definitely go ahead and change your password. You never know what it could what uh, could come about from it after. Moving on to the next story. Well, our next scam involves a student. This type of scam can and does impact everyone. Yannick was finally done with his exams and looking forward to enjoying the break. Some extra cash would come in handy, so he posted his textbooks online in the typical places. You know, Facebook groups, marketplace, and the like. He wasn't getting much interest until out of the blue, someone from a bookstore messaged him to say they'd be interested. All he would have to do would be to cash the check he'd send, they'd send him and then use the prepaid FedEx label they'd send for shipping. Uh, next slide, please. He'd heard of scams like this before, so did a search for the bookstore. He found it online right away and it seemed legit. But still, it didn't seem quite right to him. So he decided to ask if other students had similar experiences, and if so, how it had gone for them. Luckily, the community came to his aid. Other students pointed out on Reddit that they'd received similar messages from different bookstores, but probably the same cyber criminal. One had been asked to e-transfer extra money he'd been sent by check to the other sellers, since the buyer claimed their store hadn't yet managed to get e-transfers set up just yet. Yannick really wanted to sell those books. So he decided to reach out to the, to the bookstore through the contact information that he had found for them online, not the information that the potential buyer had provided. The bookstore did indeed confirm that it was a scam. You might think that scammers will just target sellers with big ticket items, but no, I've personally been contacted by scammers trying their tricks for items with a value of under $50. So fine. We know this happens in reselling sites, apps, and marketplace platforms, but this couldn't also happen in unofficial or official McGill groups, right? Unfortunately, yes, this has happened and it happens regularly, um, especially when it comes down to classified towards the end of the semester, there's always that chance of fraud. And especially that double whammy of the attacker, not just getting your items, but additional of your uh, additional hard earned cash that makes this a very uh, attractive type of scam. Um, definitely taking that being um, paranoid. Make double checking to make sure that these too good to be true type of scenarios uh, are, are taken with a grain of salt, uh, but also making sure that we talk about meeting in person, having that corroboration that that's actually a person that you can trust, etc. Having someone back you up there are good recommendations that we will try to uh, encourage. Moving on. And now our final story. This one involves a beloved professor who had postponed retirement multiple times since he truly enjoyed teaching. After decades of resistance, he'd finally given in and started to explore the great wide world of the internet. Students had gotten half used to listening, 
uh, sorry, the students have gotten used to half listening to the stories of his discoveries and nodding along, discreetly exchanging grins of amusement when he discovered memes, which he promptly started printing onto transparencies and bringing in to share with the class. Yes, he still used transparencies. One small change at a time was more than enough. Thank you kindly, as he said. His students were like family, and he felt like your favorite uncle who used to slip you candies after your parents said you had too much sugar. He had some of the best historical gossip, and to this day, his former students will admit that these factoids are some of the only ones that stuck in their heads out of the whole semester. One day, they came to class and he wasn't there. At first, it was a bit concerning, since he was always there to greet them, even those who came into class early to take advantage of the quiet classroom. Five minutes went by, then 10. At this point, the students were thoroughly concerned and had finally decided to head to the faculty office to check on the situation. But then he rushed in, all rumpled and excited. The students were surprised because he was usually calm and well-pressed, but grateful to see he was okay. It soon became clear what had happened as he apologized for his lateness and explained he had just come from his bank. He had gotten contacted about an investment opportunity by someone overseas. Felt they could trust him with the opportunity, considering his esteemed position. In order to proceed, they just needed some paperwork and bank details, so could he kindly provide them as soon as possible? He had responded back eagerly and promised to gather what his new investment partner needed. I told you at the beginning there's no happy endings in true cybercrimes, but I lied. In this case, his students immediately recognized the investment opportunity for the scam that it was and took the time to explain to him about some of the common scams he could expect to encounter. While he had made contact with a cyber criminal, he hadn't yet provided them with any information that they could leverage further to steal from him. I'm happy to report that the last time one of his former students chatted with him, he was enjoying retirement alongside a rowdy assortment of cat friends. Did it happen at McGill? So yes, the story is in fact from McGill and it probably has a much more personal connection in this case. I think Maria can personally attest to that one. Um, definitely these, these, while we may think that these type of scams are easy to detect, in many cases these attacks are actually getting much more personalized, especially with people and public figures. It's everything about your top, your re area of research, your, your skill sets, et cetera, are public on the McGill webpage not to mention part of who you are. Um, these investment opportunities and so always being wary of these offers that you get out of the blue is definitely a very good first step. Um, but also looking out for one another is another area that we really want to encourage. Definitely those students looking out for their professor or you looking out for your peers is a, another way to be part of this McGill community and a safe and secure McGill community. So moving on, it's definitely a dangerous world. And yes, you are the target. I mean, we, we're always seeing these attacks evolving and attackers are always trying to find new ways to get into your uh, into your thinking, into your daily life, whether it's SMS, social media, or chat. We definitely want to encourage you to report them. Protecting yourself with, your, with password, 2FA, et cetera, moving on to passphrases, et cetera, are great ways of protecting yourself and by extension, protecting McGill and the McGill community at large. And of course, we do want people to be a bit paranoid of what they post online. Yes, we are an open community. We talk about sharing as much, but the information is power. And the more information you put out there, the more it can be used against you. Um, and so if you do find yourself a victim of cybercrime, definitely report it to us or to report it to the Canadian Anti-Fraud Center and your local law enforcement as well. So with that, Maria.
Thank you. So if you take away anything from this presentation, I hope it's an awareness that cyber criminals target your emotions. They prey on your fear, your anxiety, your hope, your love, caring, and altruism. But we can beat them at our, their own game by arming ourselves with the knowledge to identify their schemes and by looking out for each other, for our loved ones, and for our community. So thank you all for attending today. And before we kick off the Q&A period, I have a few final housekeeping notes. For those who missed it earlier, the presentation will be recorded and we'll email you the link in the next few days, along with links to other helpful resources that will be mentioned today. Please feel free to share them with your colleagues, friends, and family. If you're curious about the movie stills that we used in today's presentation, those were actually recommended to us by the wonderful McGill University Liaison Librarians. You can contact them if you're looking for a curated list of resources on a specific topic or theme, and they also give excellent book and movie recommendations. Finally, if you're a McGill student, faculty, or staff member, you still have a few hours to take our Cybersecurity Awareness Month quiz, and if you're a faculty or staff member, excluding IT services, sorry guys, you'll be entered to win a lunch worth up to $70, including tax and tip. Students will be entered to win an Apple iPad, ninth generation. You can find the contest and lots of other useful resources on our CyberSafe website at mcgill.ca slash cybersafe. When we do host future events, they'll be posted there, so make sure to add it to your bookmarks. And now we will be starting the Q&A period. We will prioritize questions that have already been asked, but please feel free to ask us more questions. Um, the first one we will actually start off with was related to our initial story of romance scams. If one suspects that a friend has fallen victim to a romance scam, what is the best way to approach that without being insulting? So this applies not just to romance scams, I think, but to any scam that you see a friend or family member potentially have fallen for it is always approach it with compassion with empathy because if the person the person has been thoroughly love bombed for instance or they've been seduced or they want to believe and it's hard when you want to believe something to be told no it's wrong one thing you can do is just research in a lot of romance scams there's information you can find on message boards. There's information you can find on Facebook. Sometimes you can file a complaint with the local police or the Canadian Anti-Fraud Centre on their behalf, but always just try to be respectful. Like I, I personally had senior family uh, members and loved ones who were approached online and it was very difficult for them because they were looking for companionship and love and they thought they had found it. The person hit all the right notes. So it's hard sometimes when the people are in that state to look at the, the facts and be logical, but if you can point out the inconsistencies and also just try to, you know, sow doubt in their mind, that helps. I think it's adding on to that as well. Definitely emotions, when emotions play into it, it's definitely hard to change that type of feeling. Um, and that shift will definitely take time. There's no quick silver bullet to really be able to change that point of view. Um, so patience is also something that we would uh, encourage and caution as well. Definitely that sense of urgency may be there to try to change that point of view very quickly, but that can be uh, quite a shock. And one thing that people are uh, accustomed, aren't accustomed to is changing quickly. We have another question. What is the definition of cybersecurity incidents? What activities constitute an incident? Do you want so to explain? Sure. So I guess if you, as you've heard throughout the entire presentation, uh, unfortunately, cybersecurity incidents really covers quite a bit. 
pretty much everything that touches computers or computing in some relation has been somewhat thrown into that mix of cybersecurity incidents. Um, and definitely because uh, the internet computing, et cetera, has made it easier to communicate, we've definitely seen an uptick in those crimes. So it ranges definitely from whether it's uh, compromising an account all the way up to um, vulnerabilities and taking down entire system uh, computers and entire networks, et cetera, and organizations, or even when it comes down to fraud, uh, leveraging cyber, uh, leveraging information technology resources, they all end up uh, getting somewhat classified into that uh, bucket. And I guess since I've kind of mentioned compromised accounts and phishing, maybe we can dive into that one a little bit deeper. Um, when we talk about phishing, what we're really talking about, uh, I guess what we're referring to is the means for, uh, I guess, an attack. And it comes from the term phishing, like when we talk about, uh, I guess, the animal and hunting fishing, et cetera, that basically an attacker is going out there with a hook, essentially trying to get to someone to bite on their, their bait and provide them information. So if you see those emails asking for, uh, or I guess nowadays even coming in through SMS, or just out there asking for people to uh, submit their login to get more information. Uh, you've missed a delivery uh, login to find out what it is, or even provide more information because we've missed you on that delivery. Uh, those are a different, I guess, variations of, uh, of a phishing type of attack. So it's essentially fraud or impersonation type of attacks. And we have a follow up question that ties in with that. Uh, can you describe phishing for those that don't know what the term means? Well, so I kind of dove into that one already. Yeah. And we have another question. What measures does McGill have in place in order to protect us from scams like these? So, from an email perspective, uh, as some of you may have noticed, uh, there's more and more uh, protections that we're building in, or that we're leveraging. Microsoft uh, has definitely made it easier for us to warn people about uh, some features we've enabled recently, about senders that you may not uh, recognize that you haven't seen on a regular basis, uh, the, even validating links, the safe links, to make sure that uh, the links that we click are actually valid and whatnot. Uh, not to mention more and more in-depth antivirus scanning. That being said, that's not going to protect everything. So there's definitely not multiple layers of uh, protections, not just technical, but also operational. So a lot of the, when we talk about, when I talk about the vulnerabilities around campus, there's definitely uh, administrators ensuring systems are up to date, uh, constantly patched and maintained in a secure configuration to prevent uh, those opportunistic attacks against legal systems. And we're not just talking about central IT, we're talking about all IT across the board, uh, not to mention monitoring. So when we have, uh, we do have a good security team here, but also all the service providers and service teams around are continually, optimally making sure the services are maintained. And should something do happen, they definitely are bringing it back to work together to make sure those incidents are more widespread. I will just take a quick moment to mention that uh, we did have an earlier presentation on October 19 by Dr. Ven Benjamin Fung, uh, Big Hackers Watching You. Uh, the link to it uh, for those who previously uh, attended will be sent out by email by the end of the day today, but it's also going to be available uh, for watching on our CyberSafe website. So if you're interested, I please uh, do go and check out our website and uh, enjoy the presentation. And also, if you're not sure how to use the Q and A uh, feature, again, you can answer. Uh, sorry, you can enter your question in WebEx at the lower uh, right of the screen. And we do have more questions now. So we used to have the infamous Nigerian Prince emails, and now we have romance scams and more personalized attacks. What do you foresee coming in the future?
That's a very difficult question to answer, unfortunately. Um, we definitely will see a lot of the same, in my, in my opinion, uh, just different flavors of variations on it. In fact, it's not, as you can tell, especially when people are mentioning the Nigerian scam, these are things that have been going on for two decades. But in fact, a lot of the same principles still apply today as they did back then. So while we may think of new different attacks or new ways to send or to reach out, that's probably the only thing that we'll see changing. In many cases, it's really about uh, an attacker really trying to do social engineering against uh, each and every one of us. Uh, just that to add that to that. Technology, we will see a lot more vulnerabilities, especially since I guess we're do using technology more and more these days as well. So we will see a kind of that mix between the two. Yeah, it's something to always keep in mind is that they're using technology to run scams that have been run for thousands of years. Like if you go back in history and e even in um, papyrus and back in, if you go look at the code of Hammurabi, there, there's actually um, legal instructions on how to deal with cases of courier fraud or how to deal with cases like it's the same scams and the same theft it's just different uh different ways of doing it you know, it's not in reinventing the wheel mm -hmm. i guess the same thing can be said about a lot of our security controls they're very much just computer implementations of the same protection mechanisms we would have done in the physical world let's talk about we could always talk about the wax seals on those uh, scrolls being sent around uh, europe etc or in asia etc different ways to validate or to authenticate our uh, messages. So we have another question. Is there antivirus software that you recommend? Um, this is a tricky one. So we do have KB articles with recommendations or at least links to be able to make an informed choice. Uh, we can't really recommend specific antivirus ourselves. One, because of the, well, we can't advocate one over another, especially if the, uh, um, how do you say, we can't push people to purchase software uh, and whatnot. However, and not to mention the fact that IT is constantly changing, even with uh, antivirus software, uh, there's always that one is improving, uh, each one is improving at different rates. So what, if we recommended something, it could always change in the future. So definitely one of the things that we would talk about is recommendations. Though Benjamin Fung did have in the last presentation that he provided, he did have a good list or a screenshot of that, of some of the ones that are out there, um, but there are definitely the online resources that you can leverage to do to, to um, be able to make an informed decision. But I guess the good thing is that there is a, definitely a large selection of free antivirus that are probably adequate for most people's per, uh, intents and purposes. Um, but it's also important to remember that these are more of a last line of defense. The best uh, prevention of that is to avoid those risky uh, behaviors that would get that malware. Um, so this next question is, has any criminal who compromised McGill systems accounts been brought to justice? What were the consequences of their actions? Um, touching on wood, so there is definitely, so, I guess when we talk about cybersecurity incidents and compromises of accounts, et cetera, we can talk about in varying degrees. Some of them, especially when we talk about foreign actors, are almost impossible to track down and whatnot. But there are definitely cases that are more close to home, and we can say for with certainty that definitely disciplinary actions or uh, proper um, consequences have been applied. So I can't go into many more details than that, but definitely when we talk about certain other types of security incidents that do have more internal impact, we definitely do have um, cases where we've had to follow through. I can actually add to this, if not in terms of compromising the real systems or accounts, but the student whose girlfriend um, basically went into his email and deleted his acceptance email. Once he actually found out later on, he brought a legal suit against her and in default, the judge awarded him 
a significant sum of money. The issue was is that, and if you go and uh, you find the stories online, the Montreal Gazette did a good piece on it. Um, there's no word on whether he was able to actually get the money for him. I think it was just a sense of being acknowledged that he he was wronged, and now he's a he's a very successful musician. So I think in the end, her name is out there as being a criminal and it's forever going to be associated with her while well, in his story that was another happy ending so let's see if we have another uh, oh yeah um how do you present how do you prevent zoom bombing um so I'm not too sure where the directions are on that, but uh, I know IT, our team had actually worked well in worked with the uh, the infrastructure team as well as TLS to kind of come up with recommendations. So that KB, I, I can't go into the details off the top of my head because I don't have a hands-on experience with that. However, TLS uh, and does have guidance on the proper configuration for I guess Zoom uh, sessions and Zoom uh, classes, meetings, etc., to reduce the likelihood of uh, those types of attacks and takeovers. Um, it's just the same within pretty much all of our online meeting conferencing solutions is we definitely do want to encourage um, proper configurations, especially like presentations of like today, um, where we want to reduce the number of, I guess, the ability to interact or to post certain things, um, or and especially screen sharing, et cetera. Um, it's also one of the reasons why we've tried to encourage as much as possible authentication, because in fact, many cases of uh, Zoom bombing and whatnot really stem from the case of anon un anonymity. Um, I think there's a, one of the things that we forget is that the, uh, the internet and anonymity, and it, it definitely increases people's um, confidence to be able to do something without being caught and, so the, uh, and not be held accountable for their actions. Yeah, so one thing to do whenever you're uh, a meeting host, if you'll notice for, for this meeting, only um, the people from our team can be seen on screen. All the attendees have their cameras turned off by default. They're all muted by default. This is something that in virtually every online meeting platform you can set up in advance. That way, as again, what Hayson said, you make people register in advance. You don't have any surprise participants, but you can also control uh, their video and audio. And that is important because uh, it has happened in the past at the start of the pandemic, for example, at McGill, um, people would crash meetings and uh, uh, play clips of Tom Cruise and dirty dancing or uh, put on a silly video. And sometimes it's going to be a joke, but obviously other times people may do something inappropriate. And sometimes it could be entirely unwitting. Like if everyone's mics are on in meetings, then uh, you get feedback and you don't want that. So just ahead of time, check the settings, go in 15 minutes early and, and do a test. We did it for this presentation, as I know some of you who came in early have uh, got to see. And now we've got one more question for Cristobal. Can you really be completely anonymous online? That's a good question. So that's a definitely a very interesting question and definitely a difficult one to answer. Um, while we can take as much precaution as well, while some of us can, you, so it, to be completely anonymous online, it's probably nearly an impossibility, and I think that's kind of something that we could factor into. Um, and I don't think Professor Fung really went into it, but uh, when it came, comes down to some of his research, um, it's always possible to how, how would you say do correlation. So while you may think that uh, you're anonymous, you're hiding. People talk about Tor networks or VPNs and whatnot. Eventually, over time, there are always those breadcrumbs that can be pieced together and, and linked back to an identity. So while we can do as much as we want to hide, in fact, over time, it's always possible to find those patterns. Um, can it make it harder? Absolutely. So definitely being able to hide as much as possible um, can make the make you a less likely target. So can an iPhone be hacked? 
is another question that kind of popped up uh, just now. Uh, absolutely. Um, just like any software, um, there are probably bugs and vulnerabilities. In fact, it was just a recent security update to the iOS system. Uh, and in fact, probably on an annual basis or regular basis, there are zero days that are actively being exploited. Um, and there are companies out there selling those zero days on the black market and leveraging them in more gray areas, selling these to uh, nation states or selling compromises to or access to um, or to nation states uh, for, uh, I guess, espionage, etc. Well, we are going to wrap up now. Uh, thank you very much, everyone who attended. And uh, we hope to see you at our next event. In the meantime, please stay cyber safe. And have a great day and happy Halloween.